Hey everyone, it's Joe Waxman and I'm back with another video. I want to look at the chart this morning of renowned author uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, author of The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. I mean, these are, it's one of the, it's up there. I mean, he's one of the most um, respected writers of all time. His, his, his universe of uh, Arda, his whole world that he created is, is one of the most um, widely celebrated and known out of the fictional universes out there. Um, so it, it's quite an accomplishment to invent your own universe, right? Where we have the uh, Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings, not only books that were written by him, but then movies were made. And then his son, after he was dead, uh, took his notes and wrote more stories onto them. I don't, I'm not really familiar with those. I just read that though. Um, but um, this world creation is, is something of, a, of a, a, quite an accomplishment. And that's why he celebrated. So he was born January 3rd, 1892 at 10 p.m. Um, in South Africa, in Bloemfontein, South Africa. Um, but he was an Englishman. He was from England originally, um, and his family went down there. And his father died when he was young, and then his mother died when he was 12. Um, but um, so he, he, you know, he did not have it easy as a, as a, as a early, as a child. But um, I think that was fairly common back then because they did not have the medicines for regular diseases. His mother died of um, um, diabetes. Uh, they did not have insulin, actually. Um, believe it or not. So yeah, fascinating. Um, he's a Capricorn son, fifth house. Fifth house is what we, one of the houses we would expect for a creative type, a writer, right? Uh, Capricorn. Um, he was also a, a college professor for a while, right? Um, and he taught writing. Uh, he was in the war. He, you know, he was uh, the, in World War I. Um, and I don't know that much details about that. I just know that he was in the war. He got drafted. Um, son's ruling really the 12th house. So already we're seeing a lot of creativity um, in Capricorn. So it's very formalized. It's very, it's going to be very formal um, sort of uh, creativity, you know, very well educated, very Capricornian, you know, um, very taking it very seriously. It's ruled by Saturn, disposited by Saturn, both his Mercury and his sun and uh mercury and saturn are perfectly square at zero degrees saturn is exalted in libra in the first house first uh quadrant house second um sign so second whole whole sign system um saturn to um uh mercury is interesting because whether it's a conjunction or a square, the square is probably a little, little easier to deal with, believe it or not, than the conjunction because Saturn stars whatever planet it conjuncts. At least in the square, it's not, I mean, squares are generally difficult, but square, it's, at least it's not touching uh, Mercury. Um, and Mercury is the Ascendant Lord and the MC Lord. So automatically we, we can say, okay, very... <clears throat> Very studious, you know, writing could potentially be a career, especially with Mercury retrograde. Mercury retrograde is going to be more internalized. So this is not somebody who's going to, you know, be a, a um, you know, impromptu speaker, just off the, off the cuff, uh, improvising like that. Um, this is somebody who's going to want to think long and hard before he, you know, moves forward with whatever it is. So that naturally, um, um, leans towards writing. Mercury retrogrades in general will, will be generally more on the writing side of things because <clears throat> they want things scripted because they got to think, 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 you know, think twice, think three times, think four times, think five times, whatever. They got to keep thinking before they, they put it out, whatever that is. So that's obviously not improv, improvisational. <clears throat> the square to Saturn is going to delay 
his education. It's going to delay his, his intellect because Saturn um, is, is going to make it, um, it causes, uh, it can cause um, educational um, learning disabilities, like pretty much basically, you know, the, the person is slow in the beginning when they're young. As they get older, they work hard, 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 like Saturn's just that endless working and they get great, they become fantastic. So, I mean, and Saturn makes, uh, endures whatever it touches. So here we can obviously see that his intellect, which is ruling his, you know, it's his ascendant Lord and his MC Lord, um, his Mercury, <clears throat> which is leaning towards writing, um, with this exact square to Saturn, it's going to make him be able to write long, right? So how long did it, were, they, were his novels? I don't know, hundreds, and I don't even, I didn't read them. Uh, to be honest, I didn't read them. I have, I, I can't, I don't read because, not like I can't read, I can read. I don't like to read because I, I'm just too, you know, it's my my son, Gemini and, and Venus, and probably more to the point, my, my uh, Uranus conjunct descendant, I'm just too erratic. I really am. I just can't, I can't uh, focus. I can meditate, but not on reading. I, I don't read. Um, <clears throat> I don't like to read. I don't like to read long things. I can read short things, uh, articles, but I, I don't have the attention span to read a novel, anything like that. But anyway, Saturn square Mercury is going to make him over time be able to write long time. And let's just cover this part right away. Um, Saturn is stationary, okay? And that means his Saturn is extremely powerful, right? Extremely powerful. Nothing's out of bounds, nothing else is stationary. Uh, retrograde Mercury, uh, retrograde Neptune, Pluto, most significant is retrograde Mercury. So that's gonna automatically lean him towards something more scripted, right? Writing, like writing. Um, as far as his mercurial expression, and it's a very important, it's the most significant planet because it's his ascendant lord again, and his MC lord, his career, you know, the uh, public, the public recognition MC lord, tenth house lord, ruler. In it's in the fourth house, but fourth house is still a house of creativity, right? It's Cancer's natural house. It's and it's in Capricorn. Capricorn is not generally we don't think of as very creative, but Capricorn can be quite creative, right? It can be. Um, definitely. Um, and one, two, three, four, five, it has Taurus in the fifth house from Capricorn. So definitely. Um, anyway, um, Saturn stationary exalted. So this Saturn, I mean, this Saturn is uh, incredibly powerful and it's not going to become, it's going to take time to develop as Saturn always does, but he did not re uh, release uh, he did not finish The Hobbit till he was well into his 50s, right? So we can see that he had to be, he had to be an adult. He had to be grown up. He was teaching college. He was teaching, doing other things, going to war and stuff like that. Um, exalted Libra, zero degrees, stationary. This, it doesn't, I mean, it's in the first house. So it's like affecting everything. Like he's basically like, um, you know, has to mature, has to grow up before he becomes really, really strong. Saturn is ruling fifth house of creativity and sixth house of um, conflict, uh, health and illness, um, daily mundane work, right? So the things he's doing every single day regularly, Venus is there, Venus is, uh, Saturn's is positing Venus. So again, we're getting daily creativity. Venus is ruling the ninth house, which we would think of as you know, the higher philosophy, religion, higher education. So college, daily work, teaching college, right? Venus is a, a planet of creativity. Um, it's in Aquarius. So here he's also, <clears throat> um, there's something very um, different, you know, Aquarius is always unusual and different. And there's a lot of humor in Aquarius because of the unusualness of the weirdness, the oddity. And there's, there's a lot of uh, intellectual creativity, invention, science, um, <clears throat> and of course, thinking about all of society. So Aquarius has a very big 
scope, very big mind. It likes to think about much more than itself. It likes to think about society. So there's this is a very creative aspect. And sixth house is not necessarily um, creative in itself, but what it is good for is that that Virgo sort of editing the creativity. Like, um, and I always say this, you know, it's, well, when, when you do it every day, you got to repeat yourself. But anyway, it's that sixth house ability to edit. It's a very intellectual house. It's the, a very, it's a house of, of, of um, you know, being able to think very analytically um, in, in um, you know, with Virgo, Virgo skills, Virgo analysis, Virgo critical thinking ability. <clears throat> so <clears throat> Venus always has creative ability, but here it's becoming very critical, uh, almost like Venus and Virgo where it's debilitated. So yeah, there's some, some difficulty with um, Venus in the sixth house. It's not that happiest placement for Venus, but Venus is becoming very intellectually empowered. And Aquarius is also playing into that, helping along with that a lot, adding, adding humor and, um, you know, great editing ability for his writing. Okay. And again, disposited by this phenomenally powerful Saturn, exalted Saturn at zero degrees. Planets at zero degrees, um, they can go to extremes. They can go huge. They just don't, they don't have limitations. It's not like a planet at 15 degrees or 29 degrees where it's going to be, you know, <clears throat> have a lot of experience in the sign. It's just gonna go, it's gonna be very um, imbalanced, you could say, like, and just go to ex extremes. And, and Saturn um, is a very mature planet that takes a long time to, to, to grow up, to mature, to develop, um, but then it can do very long things. Like Saturn is long, right? Long lasting, long in duration. So you can see here how he's able to, um, <clears throat> you know, with the square to Mercury, create his own, his own world, his own universe, right? The imagination of, of the, the duration. We're, this is not imaginative, this is long in duration, but fifth house is very imaginative, um, long in duration. So that's one clue, like how do you develop your own, you know, you, you know your own universe and basically do it in an, such an excellent way? Well, this is one big clue, an, an exalted stationary Saturn at zero degrees, uh, ruling the fifth house, um, you know, in the first house. The first house is going to influence everything. It's, a, it's the most important. It's the most influential house, first house. All right. Uh, moon is in Pisces, along with Jupiter, uh, on the descendant. Um, and this is fantastic. I mean, you know, ideally, we would have these closer, moon and Jupiter. Series is in here. I should probably just get rid of it, but I, I just left it. I don't. I don't know what it's doing for him, so just ignore that for now. Um, but the Moon Jupiter, thirteen degrees. It's still. It's still influential. I mean, and then Pisces Jupiter rules Pisces. Pisces is naturally the sign of of huge creativity. You know, imagination, fantasy. Okay, this is very very fitting. Moon and Jupiter, they just, they benefit each other tremendously because Jupiter is exalted in the sign of moon, Cancer. Jupiter here rules Pisces. So Jupiter is very strong. Moon is benefiting greatly from that. Um, moon benefits from Jupiter because it's the great benefic and it, uh, it's just a tremendous combination. You see this often with, with um, really powerful people. They just have this moon, Jupiter, like a really strong moon Jupiter and in the seventh house, both moon and Jupiter do excellent uh, either independently or together in the seventh house. Um, <clears throat> so um, yeah, and you know, this is not a house. I mean, that, no, a lot of times I would think like, okay, it's good for being on stage, good for singing, good for speaking, but here is it's obviously good for writing too. OK, um, and this probably helped a lot with his teaching ability, you know, being in classroom, being in front of people, because uh, this is a house of others. So you're not a, I'm not automatically going to be like, oh, this is this makes an excellent writer. But um, in this case, you know, I, I um, obviously it does. 
Okay, um, we get these this tremendous conjunction in 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 Merc in Gemini of Pluto and Neptune, uh, six and seven degrees. Um, you know, almost conjunct the MC, basically conjuncting the MC from the ninth house, but still. So the ninth house here would um, reflect his higher education, you know, being a college professor, obviously, but also his career in Gemini. Uh, he taught um, writing, I guess. Um, and then he was a writer. So Gemini, writing. I mean, duh. Um, Pluto and Neptune. Neptune is the planet of fantasy and um that's i mean that's one of the main planets we would look to for for somebody who's going to invent you know their whole uh, uh, an entire universe with everything in it is neptune and then pluto is really great because pluto kind of brings in a very powerful element an obsessive powerful element and and it's not just that he invented this whole universe it's it's a fantastic universe with really wonderfully powerful and, and and lovable you know characters and enemies and like you know the whole the whole shebang you know like we need that pluto in there to make it give it some impact right you know we want the strong enemies we want that 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 you know feeling of 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 you know being overwhelmed by the potential of of the this this you know massive dark army and the dark forces of you know the the eye and all that and the whole thing, you know, like the Pluto, the dark element, right? It's got to mix in with the fantasy, with Neptune, and then in Gemini, the writing, and then the, you know, the the conjunct the MC, what he's known for. I mean, this this is fantastic. This is really really strong here. Okay. Um, what else? Um, South Node. I mean, this this is super strong as well. It's third house, third house writing. Okay, Gemini, third house. In Scorpio, Mars is Mars is rulership in rulership of, of Scorpio. So Mars here is super strong in the third house, conjuncting the South Node um, in in Scorpio. Don't forget, I mean, South Node, South Node contact, South Node position is extremely important, extremely powerful as far as what kind of skills the person has. So here, South Node is in the third house, storytelling, expression, writing, speaking um you know the intellect right uh extremely strong uranus is um technically in the second house by quadrant but conjuncting the third house in scorpio a lot of people say uranus is exalted in scorpio i have uranus in scorpio um so i agree with that because and it's not just because i have it i mean uh, there's a lot of reasons why i think um why i agree that uranus is exalted in scorpio um because it, it, Scorpio is has that that depth of Pluto, and then Uranus can is one of the planets that can really stand up to the Plutonic energy because it, it's complementary in that Pluto goes so deep and Uranus goes so big, right? Uranus is the explosion of realization, the Great Awakening. So it's mass explosion of awareness, and then Pluto is that depth, that penetrating depth. Nothing is deeper than Pluto. Right. So we have this this dynamic combination of depth and, and breadth with Uranus and Scorpio. It's a bit like Uranus conjunct Pluto in Virgo in the 60s. That was so powerful because Uranus and Pluto together are just this dynamo energy. It's dynamo. They, they both do similar things. They both have this destructive quality that is creative at the same time but they accomplish it in different ways. And together, it's just, it's, it's, it's really fantastic. It's really something else. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of Uranus-Pluto combinations, whether it's Uranus in Scorpio or Pluto and Uranus conjunct in Virgo. And we're going to see it again when Pluto comes into uh, Aquarius pretty soon, next few years. Uh, we're going to have a similar <clears throat> energy, although different, but similar. Uh, and then all of this is conjuncting his third house. Well, Uranus is going to conjunct the third house, cause Mars uh, conjunct south node in the third house in Scorpio. So third lord in third house, uh, bring in eighth house as well. Eighth house would add um, an element, a very, a very, again, plutonic element 
we're bringing in Scorpio, Scorpio energy um, because Scorpio and then the eighth house is Scorpionic. Um, originally, Mars rules Venus. I mean, Mars rules Aries and Scorpio. So they're bringing in a lot of that, that depth, that, that's the secrets. And that's a, a, another reason why um, Lord of the Rings was so powerful. It has that, it wasn't just like this nice story, you know, it had that real depth <clears throat> that Pluto, Scorpio, eighth house can bring. Um, you know, the, the, the real sacrifice, the real power, the real uh, the, the secrets and the, all the darkness, you know, bring in that darkness that, that we, we love to love. We love to be scared of too. Um, so it's very dynamic. South node, Mars, third house, Scorpio, Uranus, uh, really, really powerful combination here. Um, that's trining the, well, square Venus, right? So um, we're getting a lot of conflict here, but don't forget with a really good Saturn, squares are not such a bad thing because a good Saturn um, is a type of person that has the, the discipline within themselves to make really good use of squares. I found this to be true, um, that the squares for a person with a good Saturn is not so difficult. They just work right through it and it doesn't, you know, they, they resolve that, that challenge. But, you know, some challenges, some squares are good. Um, they give us conflict. And they're great for writing because they're going to write, whoever has a square is going to write the square into their stories. You can't help it. He's writing his whole chart into his story. We're seeing the whole Lord of the Rings Hobbit right here. This is the Lord of the Rings. This is the chart of the Lord of the Rings. I mean, we can make a separate chart for when it was released or whatever, but essentially um, this is the Lord of the Rings. This is the Hobbit right here. <clears throat> it's why it's so good. Um, Squares to Venus. I mean, we're getting a lot of passion, a lot of fighting. Um, you know, Uranus and, and Mars. We're getting a lot. Of, Uranus is bringing in a lot of uh, freedom, rebellion. Um, well, Aquarius too. You know, it's it's Venus is in Aquarius, square Uranus and Mars uh, in Scorpio. I mean, that's a lot of intensity, um, a lot of you know, twists and turns, and it just makes it more nuanced. It makes it more, I mean, his ability to write is just going to be more um, complex because we have all these different elements playing together. You know, this exalt, this super powerful Saturn, right? Uh, square the Mercury at zero degrees. And then um, in conjunct moon, so still making contact to moon because exact degree, that's very powerful. And this is a, this is like a, in conjuncts, when they're um, exact, are um, potentially very difficult. I mean, that's probably the most difficult aspect, an in conjunct, because this represents, a, this is a six, six house, six, um, six, eight. Uh, Saturn's eighth from the moon, and moon is sixth from Saturn, but exactly. Um, so there, there's a lot of conflict um, and crisis, uh, but with this exalted Saturn, it's, it's, it's somehow okay because the moon is benefited by Jupiter and Pisces in the seventh house, conjunct the descendant, and Saturn is just this dynamo, uh, stationary, exalted. Um, so any contacts from Saturn in this chart are particularly good, they're, they're good, right? even the squares and the inconjuncts. It just makes it more dramatic. It's adding drama is what it's doing. And we get a lot of drama in his, um, in his books, right? Uh, and that's a good thing because it just keeps us on the edge of our seat. Oh my God, oh my God, is Frodo going to live? Are they going to live? Are they, what's going to happen to the ring? And all this, you know, all this sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> conflicts are good for this chart. Uh, we got the square between Pluto and Neptune to the moon and, and Jupiter. Again, more conflicts. Good, because they resolve. They work out in the end. They harmonize in the end because of the, you know, mostly because of this powerful Saturn. I'm going to say this is the reason everything comes together in the end. And this is why it's like 
you know, everything feels like it's going to fall apart. Everything feels like it's going to break with these squares and everything. But I mean, the Saturn pulls it all together and then the moon, Jupiter and Pisces, seventh house, you know, everything works out. And then there's also this powerful Mars, south node. And then north node is in uh, Taurus. Again, Taurus, creativity, Venus, uh, ninth house. So like publishing. And then it's conjunct algal, which is another like, I have my Mercury conjunct algal. Um, algal, as some of you may know, is a very, it's the most malefic star out there. It's Medusa's head. Uh, algal is Arabic, um, it's the root word for alcohol. So yeah, you can imagine if somebody has a, a planets conjunct algal, especially the sun or Merc any personal planets, even North Node, um, <clears throat> they should not be, they should be very careful of indulgences, alcohol, drugs, etc. cetera. Um, I know for a fact that um, people can really lose their, lose their shit, so to speak, um, with planets conjunct algal, like they can just lose their mind. They can become um, quite literally terrible people, like people who you do not want have to have anything to do with, uh, or they can become very powerful leaders and healers. I've seen both. My father has a son conjunct algal. Uh, I know another person, a great teacher, uh, Michio Kushi, who has a son conjunct algal. Uh, and again, I have my Mercury conjunct algal. I know somebody who has their south node conjunct. I, I mean, so it's a powerful, powerful fixed star, Algo. But it, interestingly, that it relates to one of the most mythical, one of the most diabolical mythical figures, Medusa, right? Medusa's head, something very demonic and evil about it. But Medusa's head was half poison, half medicine. So again, it has this thing. And then if we relate that to Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, fascinating, right? Because we have, you know, the, this parallel between Medusa and, you know, the, the, the evil forces in, in, in Lord of the Rings, you know, Sauron and all that. I mean, I'm, I'm not the most um, knowledgeable about J.R.R. Tolkien's, uh, you know, mythical world. So you'll probably have to talk to somebody else about to get more detail than that. Uh, but I do know basically what, what happens with all that, you know, the ring and everything. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is uncanny. North Node conjunct Algol. He's he's really tuning into like something very deep, dark, mystical, occult, and bringing it into the fantasy world. Um, yes, and again, if you can keep your head, you know, because that's the whole thing with Algols. You lose your head, uh, and quite literally, you turn to drugs and alcohol and lose your head. If you can keep your head, you can become a head, like a leader, a healer, a uh, very creative type. Um, and so, yes, I have my head attached to my shoulders. I have not lost my head, even though my Mercury's in Algol. And I could have, definitely, for sure, but I, I kept it. Um, finally, we have Chiron in Leo in the 12th house. And the 12th house, obviously, is very creative. When Leo is in the 12th house, it's extremely creative. Uh, that's why Virgo ascendants are, can be very, very creative. Um, but um, Chiron here, uh, any planet in the 12th house is going to be very difficult to access. We're going to have a feeling of um, uh, a sense of it that we can't touch. We can't grasp it. All the other placements we can sort of feel very strongly, but we can't grasp uh, planets in the 12th house. They're just sort of uh, elusive and we feel them and we don't know where, but there's a sense of, um, I mean, number one, creativity from Leo, but empathy towards those who are going to be, you know, the suffering of man, of humanity, the down and out, the, you know, the wounded, the rejected, those who are um, themselves just um, unhealthy, unhappy, uh, poor, sick, wounded, all that, the suffering, the suffering of man, there's a great feeling for the suffering of humanity, man, woman, everyone, right? Uh, it is opposite Venus by wide margin by um, eight degrees, but still um, Pallas Athena, I guess, you know, just adding something. Um, but um, uh, Chiron is definitely going to give him a lot of uh, empathy, compassion, caring, good feeling. And that's, that's why we, and it's, it, 
it's fairly irrelevant for him as a man, but we see it in his legacy and what he left behind, which is the Hobbit, the Lord of the Rings, right? There's an innate good quality to uh, the Lord of the Rings, and that's why we like it. It's sort of like good winning over evil, right? And with Chiron in the 12th, um, we can see that he has this, this feeling for, you know, goodness towards, towards humanity, right? Because it's in Leo, and... You know, Leo is very generous. Leo can be very egotistical, but Leo is very good hearted, big hearted, generous, caring, warm. And um, I, I believe this is, is contributing to that. Uh, it's got a square to Mars in Scorpio. So there's some conflict here again, you know, uh, Mars and Scorpio is, is quite, can be uh, quite evil, you could say, not necessarily, but potentially. Um, and then Chiron and Leo would be like the good hearted quality. And so we have, you know, there's a lot of play back and forth of, you know, the good and evil conflict, drama, things like that, which we, which makes a good story. His chart is a really, really good story. And that's what makes him so successful. Um, let's see, is there anything else worth mentioning? Uh, moon is ruling the 11th house. It basically, it's in the sixth house, but it's conjuncting the seventh house cusp. Um, Jupiter's seventh lord, seventh house, uh, fourth lord. Um, so, so, you know, from an early childhood, you know, going towards, towards relationships, others relating to others, um, in general. I mean, that's all, that's fine. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, I mean, second house is also teaching. So that makes a lot of sense. You know, ninth and second um, in the sixth, teaching as a daily, you know, a daily work job uh, with Venus, creativity, uh, Aquarius, you know, very intellectual, scientific, all that. Anyway. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, we got this fantastic Saturn. It's exalted and it's stationary. And then this moon Jupiter uh, in Pisces, seventh house. Um, and just so many other things. Exalt, uh, domicile, Mars, south node, third house. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, tremendous chart here. For J.R.R. Tolkien, it's no surprise that uh, um, he 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 wrote the you know one of the best selling. I don't know what it was. I mean, I don't know as officially, but uh, we love it. We love it no matter what it is. Uh, the Hobbit, um, Lord of the Rings, it's celebrated. So that's pretty much it for today. Uh, if you enjoy this content, don't forget to hit like, subscribe, and share. Go to my website, macroastrology.com to book a reading. And I will be back soon with another reading. All right, guys. Thanks. Bye.